Hola, how are you? Hi, John. So you're not in an airplane this week. Where are you now? I am uh, I'm back from San Francisco. I'm actually in our world headquarters in Stanford, Connecticut. So uh, great to be here. Good to see people in our office. And uh, it's, it's exciting. So good stuff. How about you? You're back home? I am. I'm back in London. Um, there's a little bit of sunshine today. I can't talk about it too much because they'll they'll blame it on me if it starts to rain. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, we've got a great guest today. I'm super excited about it. Amanda Jackson is um, supply risk management a program lead at Applied Materials, and what an incredible business and an interesting job. And I think with everything happening on supply chain. And around risk and security, I think this is a perfect topic for the times. Yeah, I agree. Let's bring her on. All right, awesome. Hi, John. Amanda, how are you? Hi. Great. Yourself? Very good. So, um, one thing, first of all, Amanda, we've got something in common right off the bat is we both graduated from Bryant University. We did, and and partly when it was still Bryant College. So I was part of the class. It was both Bryant. Bryant College and Bryant University because I got my MBA there as well. So wow, <laughs> very few times. people can say that they went to Bryant College and University. So that's <laughs> that's awesome. Well, good. Welcome to the show. And um, this is really interesting. Maybe quick background: Applied Materials. Maybe not everybody. It's not a household known, name to everybody, but every household probably utilizes Applied Materials. It's a twenty-five billion dollar company. If you had to just describe it, I know this is always hard to do. What would you say Applied Materials does? Yeah, it's it's really hard to describe because it, it kind of does everything. You know, we're in semiconductor chip manufacturing and, and chips exist in, in almost everything you use today. Um, so if if it has a chip in it, we've probably touched it. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Amazing. And you also do some other material products as well. Right. So if I, even some I saw some consumer packaged goods products and. And uh, so even if I'm eating a bag of chips, I might be use, utilizing something that Applied Materials was part of. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. So Amanda, um, I am really curious, uh, risk and compliance, what, what led you here? What was your career path? Uh, was this your choice? Did you stumble into it? Uh, give me yeah, a little bit so of background. Not many job fairs in high school and in college have people coming and saying, hey, want to be in supplier risk management? No, um, actually, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I thought, hey, I really like math. And they said, well, you could be a math teacher or you could be an accountant. And I looked around at my uh, 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 the other students around me and said, I think I'll go accounting. Um, <laughs> and uh, that brought me to Bryant. I did the traditional accountant route as far as uh, going into public accounting, becoming a CPA, uh, auditing other companies, uh, then, of course, going into the business. Uh, when I went and looked into the business, I ended up in an in, in internal audit um, role. And it was right around the time right after Starbase and Oxley first got passed. And so we were really looking at the, all those critical controls um, and, uh, you know, kind of interesting, like anytime a regulation kind of comes through, you have this immediate response, this kind of fire drill response where everything, uh, you go into this risk compliance where everything is important. We must monitor and look at everything. And I was there during the period when we really took a step back and said, okay, what's critical? What's mitigating? Like, what do we really need to focus on? What's the ROI? Um, and then, you know, fast forward, I end up in the business, I find myself in procurement out of all places. And they're like, uh, how do you feel about supplier relationship management, which was dealing with supplier capabilities, performance and risk. Um, so I started in that program. Um, and then COVID hit. And uh, risk became such a huge uh, thing for so many companies. I think uh, a lot of the focus and understanding just how risk impacts the relationship with the supplier and with the business. Um, and, and so that's, that's how I got here, I guess. <laughs> wow, what a great journey. And um, when we think about, you mentioned COVID, you know, how did that impact, do you think, you know, applied materials and your industry and, and risk in general, how did that change the perspective? Because I am astonished, you know, all of a sudden cars can't be manufactured because they're missing one chip. You know, what did you find at Applied Materials that kind of really started to get stressful that that COVID created? Yeah, I think that COVID um, 
brought a lot of things to light. So the supply chain, the location, where things were coming from, how much, you know, we previously, we talk a lot about tail spend um, and kind of minimizing how many suppliers we do business with. And, and I think during COVID, realizing what an impact that would be on our company uh, as we try to lower the amount of suppliers we we work with and, and really risk is important in understanding the supplies that we do decide to make strategic for our business. Um, and I would say outside of that, other things people don't think about as, as much that came up were cybersecurity. Cybersecurity became huge for us with um, a lot of ransomware attacks. They're still happening. Uh, people more working at home, leaving more uh, potential for issues to happen, not just us, but our suppliers are all working from home as well. Um, so those things kind of came up. Also, um, you know, we talk about ocean liners and logistics in there, but we also were facing a truck driver um, shortage and, and aging population pre-COVID. And then when COVID hit, um, it it became even uh, worse because some people decided to retire early. Um, so really, uh, risk is taken on many, many outlets from uh, personal privacy and uh, IP protection. It, it's quite amazing what's changed in the last three years. I'm interested in how that, how do you manage risk with a service provider while still maintaining a solid relationship, right? How do you, because there's got to be a bit of a balancing act between trying to ensure that they're compliant and helping you manage risk and that they're managing their own risk while at the same time maintaining a decent, you know, relationship with them. Are, how are you seeing that happen in real life? Yeah, absolutely. And that's going from that kind of like a, a supplier compliance to a supplier management, making sure that we're looking at the right risks with the right suppliers at the right time that we're not, um, you, we're not asking too much because often what will happen is um, we want to treat all suppliers the same and, and they're not. And uh, could you imagine doing a cybersecurity risk assessment on your landscaper? Uh, that, that, that doesn't seem very necessary, right? Um, so you want to make sure you're not doing that, um, but you don't want to miss that they there are important risks still in that business with health and safety and, and still having employees on your property. Um, but the biggest thing is you can't uh, you can't allow yourself to be in this compliance space that you are hindering the relationship. You're causing the supplier more costs that they're of course going to pass on to you, um, and also not making them think that you are big brothering them, looking over them like they don't know how they don't know their own business. They know their business better than anyone. Yeah, yeah when you think point. about risk risk compliant versus risk management. What, why is, what is the difference between that? I mean, how does that, how does that work? Yeah, so the way I define risk compliance is exactly that. You're just complying, you, um, you're checking a box, you're doing it to say that you did it, and you're kind of treating all your suppliers the same. Uh, risk management is more segmenting, considering it starts, um, it starts early on in the life cycle of the supplier when you're doing your category strategy. Okay, what are the risks that most relate to this area? What, is, what are the mitigating controls that are already in place? Um, and then taking it from there of who, who do we have to watch? and how often and develop that relationship in that way. Amanda, what are the risks that concern you most? Where are the areas where you focus, you know, the majority of your attention? I recognize how hard that must be to answer because it's probably, well, all of them. Um, but to your point, there's a, probably a prioritization that you're going through or something that you're doing to make sure that you're focused on the right things. What are those big things that, that concern you most? Yeah, so I work with a great group of different risk teams that kind of have their own focuses and it, it's, you know, trying to bring them all together. And I think the primary concern that we all have um, is really around intellectual property at Applied. That's really important to us. That's our business. How do we protect it? Um, and that streams out into a lot of different uh, risks when we talk about our continuous workforce, um, when we talk about cybersecurity, personal data, all of this, you know, it ends up um, in the same space. How is it that we are protecting our intellectual property? How is it that we're in, uh, protecting our employees? Yeah, when you think about this, it's, you know, risk is so critical and COVID, I think, really escalated the importance of of risk management and, and risk, you know, compliance. 
but but uh, also at the same time, we want a customer experience, right? You need to create an experience with your partners, et cetera. So that balance, how do you work with other departments with inside of Applied Materials to kind of help them succeed um, and create a good user experience and customer experience, right? That's a challenge, right? It's a huge challenge, and it's definitely something that needs to be enabled by technology because um, a lot of different risks, you're asking the same questions, you need the same information. Uh, so how do you share that internally so that you're not going back to that supplier three and four times asking them the same question? Um, yeah, it's, it's hard um, and, and definitely enabled by a really good uh, infrastructure of technology. Yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. I know when clients that that um, that we work with, and I'm in I'm in Europe, so our regulatory environments a little maybe I'm going to say a little more strenuous than than it probably is elsewhere. Um, so there's a lot of regulation that you know really does come under that risk and that compliance um, landscape. I think we do see a tendency of uh, a check the box. So I loved your definition of, uh, of compliance or, or um, uh, versus risk management. Um, part of what I see in organizations as well is if you have a lot of suppliers in your landscape, it, it, it seems like it's easier to, to make a very steady program where everybody's being, you know, just ch check the box. Has lowering the number of, uh, of vendors in your environment, has that helped to, to allow you to focus vendor by vendor by vendor versus I've got so many suppliers in my environment, it's almost impossible for me to do that. I almost have to peanut butter spread the whole risk management subject. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the less new suppliers you onboard, the easier it is to get to know who your supply base is and, and measure what uh, risk and, and where they are. So having less, but it's also um, it's still it's very dependent on category because some categories you, you know, you need more uh, diversification within your supply base in order to um, take away from other risks within um, that we saw, like I said, during COVID where, you know, certain suppliers just can't um, meet your needs. So it's, uh, it's definitely a, a balancing act. And I'd say, you know, with risk management versus compliance is the other side of also, uh, there's always going to be a black swan. There's always going to be events we can't necessarily prepare for. So how are we prepared in general? And I think um, pre-COVID, we, we thought, a lot about uh, what we would consider like a blackout preparation. So if a supplier went bankrupt, uh, a lot of concentration on, on financial risk, if they went out of business for any reason, you know, what do we do? How do we pick up and move? But now in the current climate, especially with these ransomware attacks and cybersecurity, we talk about gray outs. What if we just can't use the supplier for the next month or two while they figure out how to clean up their, their system? And, and, you know, we need to prepare for that on a larger level because, in reality, it could, uh, as, as much as we have the controls in place, they have the controls in place, there's a possibility for it to happen anywhere at any time. And so we need to have a plan so that we're not fire drilling and, and running around the, uh, the office with our heads cut off. You know? Ola, I'll ask this question of you is, is when you think about our clients, I think a lot of clients utilize GovernX to kind of help um, with regards to like managing their agreements and understanding SLAs and understanding risk. Um, have things changed with regards to you seeing clients look for more near shore, onshore type of solutions or vendors or partners, or what are your thoughts on Ola? And then Amanda, certainly I see you nodding your head. I'd love to get your perspective just from how you're handling that piece. Yeah, I think uh, Amanda's hit on uh, a lot of the points that we hear from a lot of our clients, which is how do I minimize the risk in my environment? And it's not just to, to her point, business continuity. It's not just about, oh, the whole thing, you know, stopped working. But even just areas of the business that get impacted by that risk. And some of that has to do with not actually minimizing the number of suppliers in your environment. As an example, it might be extending the number of suppliers in your environment so that you have an actual backup plan that's that's resident for you. But what I also see with a lot of organizations is they need to manage it. You know, the, the, the times when we would just go and say, well, we've got this Sarbanes-Oxley thing and I need you to go, you know, respond to this audit is one thing. And yes, that needs to be managed as well. Um, you know, just that, that compliance piece does need to be managed, particularly if I have yeah. either, you know, certifications or regulatory requirements that I'm trying to respond to. But just managing the risk of the business 
I mm-hmm. think is a real is a much broader subject. And I think most organizations are recognizing that. So when you think about suppliers in the environment, they constitute, a, they're a part of your ecosystem. And so your risk management practice really has to, has to really look across both the suppliers mm-hmm. in your environment and your own environment. So it has to almost have a continuity view of it that says there's a risk and here's the, here's the broadness of it. Amanda, I presume that that's happening for you as well, right? Absolutely. And there's a piece of change management, too, where the business has to understand the risk, too, right? Um, yeah. You know, especially in, in the indirect space, sometimes we underestimate how much risk that suppliers may or may not bring in. And the business is like, I need this. I need it now. I need it yesterday. I just can't you just get this done. Um, and so really bringing them to the table to understand uh, what risks are involved with the, the products or the services that they're requesting and, and the suppliers and, and helping them make the best choice of who to work with. Yeah, I think almost this whole the analogy I would utilize is like the uh, environment circle of life. You know, you think, oh, let's eradicate the mosquito. But then it causes this issue upstream. And next thing you know, we have a giant problem with human, you know, human uh, sustainability. And it seems to be the same with the vendor is like, well, that, that's a vendor that just does X, Y, Z. It's not that important. But all of a sudden, there's this ripple effect. And then it impacts all the way up the food chain. Uh, Amanda, when you think about like how you help support your vendors, do you have programs to kind of give them coaching or advice on how to help them be more successful and sustainable? I mean, I think that would be something that would be an asset to them. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of our assessments we share with them. And that's part of the partnering part of uh, the relationship building. So when we go in and do a cybersecurity assessment of them, we're assessing the controls they have internally. And we provide that to them and give them some ideas or thoughts about how they could maybe strengthen things. As well as, of course, we strengthen things on our side, uh, knowing where they're at, we try to uh, leverage and give them that. Um, Even with our financial health, right? Like when we go out, uh, we use a company called Rapid Ratings. When they do the financial analysis for us, we provide that back to the supplier to let them know, hey, here, you know, I don't know how you feel about this. Here are your strengths. Where where are you at? How can we work together, um, you know, for more strategic suppliers? How can we work together to um, get through some of these hurdles? Uh, You know, right now, obviously, we're we're entering another hurdle with uh, fi- with uh, interest rates going up. So we have, you know, suppliers facing new concerns now. Yeah, that's actually interesting. Are you going as deep as understanding their kind of debt limits and areas that, that they may be at risk with regards to interest rates? Sometimes it's important because uh, it's really important, especially for some of the smaller suppliers or, or suppliers that aren't doing as well. If they're heavily leveraged, we do need to understand how leveraged they are um, to to make sure that they're going to be able to get that refinancing because, you know, we're definitely tightening our, our belt. Ola, what are we seeing with our clients? Has there been a, uh, some, str- some uh, stress on the market with regards to interest rates? Yeah, of, of, of course. And it depends on where you are in the in the world and what your specific ep- economic condition is. We've seen some differences, you know, industry to industry as well. I think companies like yours, Amanda, probably see it uh, even more strenuously because you're a part of the supply chain for a lot of different industries, <laughs> obviously. And so that means that um, singular industries can actually have a different risk profile, I would suspect, um, that you're actually using either in your supply chain itself or your client, your customer base. So, but I do, I do think that particularly for organizations that supply a broad swath of the market, um, their look at what constitutes risk uh, becomes far more complicated uh, because they have to look at both sides of the equation. Risk is not just a, a byproduct of what's happening within your supplier community or your supply chain. It's also risk that uh, could be constituted in your ability to be able to, you know, achieve whatever kind of loans or financial positioning that you need to have for, you know, products or materials that you need to purchase as well. So risk is a very broad subject. And and I think one of the things that I've seen happen with, with clients these days is, and I think Amanda, you alluded to this earlier, is that risk becomes a, uh, a practice that I need to have everywhere. It's not just risk in supplier management and risk in, you know, procurement and risk in employment. It's risk everywhere. It's sort of a, a, a bigger umbrella I think is the way most clients are trying to look at it. There are different risks 
again, Amanda mentioned this as well, right? I need to focus on specific risk and cybersecurity maybe with my IT environment versus I might be looking at a different type of risk in my financial arena or with my employees. But I need to look at it in an umbrella way and in a relatively consistent way because I need to be able to assess it across all of those different categories, not just focus so much in one area to the exclusion of others. I've got to have that umbrella that goes across uh, the entire risk environment, I think, within most enterprises. Yeah, I, I'd like to think of, I think, risk in this whole area is is been an, an, a business enabler. Um, you know, listen, if you don't leave your house, it's 100 percent chance you're not going to get hit by a car. <laughs> um, but you're not going to have a great life. So I think, you know, the key is how does risk allow you to leave your home and minimize the risk of being hit by a car while still getting the most out of life? And I think when we think about business, that's, Amanda, probably some of the, your responsibility with you and your team and what your leadership looks for, right? It's like the easy answer is, yeah, listen, we're not going to do anything because it's safer not to. But that's right. not the answer, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. Um, you know, we can we can tie ourselves in, in red tape and never bring on a new supplier, never, uh, you know, really limit uh, things or, or make them take a bunch of hoops. But we can't grow as a business if we do that. Uh, another analogy that I found funny, I don't know if you saw this uh, a few weeks ago in Washington, D.C., a toddler got through the gates uh, at I the White House. That. I did yeah. see that. I said, what a, what a great risk analogy, right? You put up this big fence and you have an incident. Someone gets in and there's, you know, the, the immediate reaction is every, you know, the world's on fire. What are we going to do? And then the, uh, the security comes through and gets the toddler and brings them back to the parents. That's a perfect risk management analysis. Like you have a control. There was a gap. You have a mitigating control and it picked up like that. That's a successful risk management. Um, but oftentimes we look at that and like, oh, my God, we need we need a better fence. We need to take out the holes. We need another fence in front of it. Um, and it's not necessary. You know, you need to decide the ROI on that. Is is the risk big enough? What's the future risk? And, and do we really need to do more or did did our plan work? Did it function as intended? Well, ROI and experience, to your point earlier, right, is the experience of how you work with your vendors and partners and how you your customers see you. There's You have to weigh experience on top of risk as well, right? Yes, absolutely. All of it uh, comes in comes into play. I'm glad the toddler's okay. That's good news. <laughs> But it is it is a great analogy. I mean, the the entire uh, you know the entire perspective around risk is is doing what Amanda is saying is to assess the potential. Um, yeah. Risk is risk is I think far more about assessing the potential and your mm -hmm. potential reaction to it more than you know putting up so many fences that nothing ever happens. I would imagine that uh, you know the pandemic and everybody shutting down changed the risk profile in a variety of different ways. And then as we came back, the, suddenly that risk profile changes again. So, so my uh, not being a risk, risk expert here, Amanda, but I would imagine that just uh, as the world turns, that risk profile is probably constantly changing in terms of what constitutes risk, what doesn't, and, and what your risk profile actually looks like. Yeah, absolutely. The perfect black swan in, in COVID, you know, everything shuts down and, and you just you can't plan for that. You um, you you plan around it. You you know, it, it was definitely said, oh, this could never possibly happen. And um, and it did. So, you know, you you plan for the impossible um, and hope that it never happens. And you can never be too over prepared, um, but you can't you can't put up all the fences and, you know, that's not being prepared keeping the world out, keeping your business from growing. That's not preparation. It's having the plan in place that, okay, the incident happened. How do we respond quickly and remain agile um, and get our business back up and functioning the way it should be? When you, um, when you look at where your leadership inside of risk um, reports up into, is it going all the way to a board level at some points with regards to the business? Are, are boards getting some of the information that you're providing? 
Um, they they are, and and leadership really goes across. Uh, it goes across finance and legal, um, and yeah. even within operations. And and a question for you, because I think this will be interesting for people that are listening in, is when you think about your career journey, what advice would you give with regards to kind of getting into risk as a professional? Uh, and, the, you know, how would you, rec- what would recommendations would you give with regards to people that want to get involved in this space? Because I think it's in a very interesting space. I think it's going to get more and more interesting over the next few years. So how, what would you make recommendations? How would you recommend somebody getting involved? Um, yeah, so, it, you know, getting involved um, is is hard hard to say, like, there's so much out, out there to, to do your research, understand. Uh, I've got a lot of great um uh, companies like State of Flux that uh, have, have really great analogies of um, how to manage the, the full supplier relationship and how to manage your risk. Um, there's learnings out there. It's such a big uh, industry right now and, and really a lot of um, interest. Uh, I still don't know that there's many degrees in it. I haven't been to Brian lately, no. though. You'll have to tell me. But um, <laughs> it's definitely a growing market and a growing concern. So um, yeah, I guess, you know, you just put yourself out there and, and see if this is your passion. I, I have a 16 year old. So that that's, you know, career opportunities is, is the conversation in the household. Like, you oh. know, you got to find your passions, you got to, you know, and right. just uh, my trajectory, uh, career trajectory th- was very thankful for the, the managers that I reported to and the leadership I reported up to. Um, allowed me to pursue things of my interest that weren't probably the normal accounting path. And, and that's okay. And it's okay to do that in your career. That's fabulous. That's fantastic. Yeah, I love that. And, and Amanda, last question before we let you go is um, we talk a lot about uh, mentorship, um, allies and sponsors at ISG and with our clients. Okay. Um, do you feel like you've had some good mentors and it sounds like, and then it sounds like your manager's have been great sponsors of you. Has that been the case? Yeah, I've had, I've worked for some amazing just leaders, overall department leaders. Um, I've, I've worked for three rather large companies, uh, CVS, TJ Maxx, and, and now Applied, mm-hmm. and all of them just great leadership, um, department leadership. And the manager myself really, um, I've had a few managers that have seen in me and kind of pushed me towards, you know, where they saw my passions going. Um, I've been really, really lucky, and, and I can say a lot for mentorship programs are uh, are so important. It's so important to get down to that personal level. Where are you going? What do you want to do? Uh, what makes you want to get up in the morning? It's not necessarily, you know, moving up in your career as much as making sure that every morning when you get up, you want to be doing that because you're spending a third of your life at work. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's right. Well, man. Thank you so much for your time. It's been wonderful, uh, you know, just speaking with you today. It's been just great. Thank you. Great conversation. Thank Thanks, Amanda. Take care. Bye now. Wow. Oh, great, great conversation. Hi, I learned a lot. It makes you think a lot, doesn't it, John? I mean, most of us, I don't on a daily basis, sort of think about the risk profile, you know, of what's happening, happening with a company, because it's just not, you know, not my primary focus. But how important is that to organizations and the ability to be able to respond appropriately means you have to manage, you have to manage that risk so that you're, you know, yeah, your probability may be low, but boy, if it happens to her point, I better be ready to (laughs) at least know instead of running around like headless chickens, let's at least have some plan about, about what it is we want to do. So just fascinating. Yeah. And this job function just is another example of, Areas that 10 years ago, frankly, were lower in the business, right? They were cost centers, just things that were there. And now are at the board level with regards to having a very positive impact on businesses. So I love to see this. I think Amanda's got a great career ahead of her and she's already done a lot. So this has been a lot of fun and uh, look forward to our next conversation. It has. Me too, John. Take care. See you next time. Bye.